Okay, good morning, everybody. Um, thanks for having me here. I come from a very different world from most of the people here. So if there's anything that I say that isn't clear, stick it in the questions or really just stick your hand up and shout. Um, I'll be glad to answer questions if anything is unclear. So the last few years, I've been studying a concept called group privacy. Um, there is a lot of debate about this. I hope that some of it will take place today. Basically, it comes from the idea that data solutionism is going to have unintended consequences. This is a quote from Jorge Luis Borges. You may have read his Library of Babel. It's a very beautiful, very short story. I recommend it. About a library that's found by mankind, which contains all the possible combinations of all the letters. And so there is a book in there that tells everybody's life story. There is a book in there that makes no sense at all to anybody. There is every possible kind of book. And he says, when it was proclaimed that the library contained all books, the first impression was one of extravagant happiness. There was no personal or world problem whose eloquent solution did not exist in some hexagon of the library, he says. This is an obvious metaphor now, I think, for big data and for the excitement that we all have about what data may do for us and do for our world. Here's another version of that story. It's a, picture, it's a, it's a created picture by an architectural student, Olivier Charles, of Stockholm's public library. I don't know if you, any of you have been there, but this is actually just a wall. And what he's done is put an unending store of knowledge there, descending into the depths of the library in a way that you can never really access. So you can see the knowledge, but you can never really understand what it tells us. And this is one possible metaphor for what big data is going to become for us. Because by 2030, profiling is going to be based on data gathered over decades, obviously. But in 100 years from then, profiling is going to be based on data gathered over generations. That starts to have very different implications. What does it say that my grandchildren's grandchildren are going to be judged, at least partially, on data that I'm producing today, under the rules of today? In the end, our collective history is going to be a better predictor of our behavior, our preferences, our possibilities, than our individual history will. And here we get to the problem, which is that our current system is very much based on the idea of personal data. Um, as we all know, because we're all here at this conference. The GDPR is very clear. The principles of data protection only apply to information related to an identified or identifiable natural person, personal data. And once it's rendered anonymous so that you're no longer identifiable, we don't care about it. The GDPR says it doesn't matter. If it doesn't have your name attached or a specific identifier, and the GDPR has lots of ideas about what identifiers are, it's fairly broad, it does its best. If those identifiers are not present, it really doesn't care. That data is the same as deleting data, anonymizing data. We can say that we don't know what anonymization is. It's a very complicated idea. We don't know how to fully anonymize data. That's one argument. I'm going to bypass that and go to the idea that we can actually anonymize data, that you can de-identify it fully. We are still left with a liberal individual model for data management, basically. The GDPR, the fair information practice principles, all of the frameworks that we have focus on the individual and their relationship to their data. As long as I can control my data, everything is basically okay. We all know this list, right? what personal information exists, what the content is, you can rectify it if that content is wrong, you can audit who's dealing with your data, you can obtain personal information, use it freely, I know none of you here have any interest in that one. You can sell personal information to third parties. You can remove or delete it. This works great as long as we know what information is circulating about us. It works great as long as we know who we gave our information to, who wants it, you know, we know what we're consenting to. I'm going to posit today that we really don't, and that that could be problematic not only for the my data model, but for just about everything we think about with regard to data rights and data management and control. Albert Sobers, who ran the first iteration of the living lab in Stratumseind in Eindhoven in the Netherlands, pointed out that the systems in place in this living lab to study people in the street, in public space, meant that 
His company was only big brother to the crowd. We don't identify anyone. And he goes on to say, and therefore we act ethically with your data. So the vision of ethical data management is really one where you can't identify individuals. So just to give you a little background, what Albert's Living Lab did and does was it had basically, it was based on a smart lamppost model where it has things like infrared movement sensors, it has noise sensors that pick up what kind of speech is going on, what kind of interaction is going on between people. It can obviously see how many people are around, how, how they're moving, how they're standing, how they're grouped, what they're doing. It has Wi-Fi capability, it has an ability to, um, it mingles also with cell phone records in real time so that it can see you know, dots moving down the street in Eindhoven and tell where they're from. Is this a North African dot? Is this a Dutch dot? Is this a Spanish dot? When you bring together all of these things, what you get is a system that knows not who we are, oh, it also has CCTV with facial recognition, but that's not attached to trying to actually identify individuals. We wind up with a system which knows who we are, what we're doing, and identifies whether we're a threat, a risk to the public area or not, without attempting to know our name. And this makes it safe. However, what it does once it identifies who we are and what we're doing by our movement traces and our behavioral traces, is it then attempts to change our behavior. If we're acting in a way that the system classifies as risky, it will spray sense into the air. It will change the way the light is around us in order to change our behavior. If it thinks that we're risky enough, it will call the cops on us automatically. Now, this is something that has very real implications for public space, for citizenship, for our relationship to the city and to the authorities in general. And yet, it's completely fine. As Albert says, we're only big brother to the crowd. It's all right. Do we think this is problematic? Do we think there is a type of data use and data management going on there that makes us uncomfortable? We may do, but we have no voice about that because it's not within the GDPR, it's not protected. I'm gonna posit that de-identified data can indeed tell a story, and that story is just as important as the story that personal data tell. Because big data is important for analyzing group characteristics, not just individual characteristics. In fact, you could make a case that big data is most useful for analyzing the crowd. It, an it helps us analyze preference and behavior on the group level. Do you behave like other people? What can we offer you that looks like something people like you would like? It enables us to see how people are moving and behaving as groups, including on the level of states or cities. And obviously, out of these come risk scoring and predictive and analytics of various kinds, which is kind of one of the points, as I understand it, of, of my data, is it enables predictive analytics on a different level. So a few years ago, I came up with an idea based on my development studies work that data protection really wasn't working on this basis, that all over the world there were people who were not being protected from very important risks to do with their data, that were not covered simply because we don't like anonymous data, we don't know what to do with it legally or conceptually. So the traditional view is that a group is a collection of privacies. This works pretty well because the law likes the individual too and human rights like the individual. It's a corporate body where you actually belong through no choice of your own necessarily, for instance, the, the state that you're born into or the university that you choose to go to. It can also be a collective according to affiliation or identity. You can be part of an ethnic group, you can be part of a political party or a social network where you may not necessarily know who all the other members are individually, but you can probably identify them through their collective membership. The data analytic perspective is very different. It becomes fluid. It's based on a chosen predicate, a chosen category. For instance, the people on the bus. This changes every time the bus stops, right? You get on, you get off. The, com the, the composite group of people on the bus is different between each stop and the next. However, if you want to intervene, if you want to, for instance, explode a bomb on the bus, there is a coherent group that you can call the people on the bus who will then suffer. Another example is people who will pay a certain amount for a certain good or service. We all know about dynamic pricing. This group changes fluidly all the time. And so algorithmically, you want to determine who the group is at that moment that will pay a certain amount, which is why it's very difficult to think legally about dynamic pricing. Um, 
tailored prices for things because we don't know who's getting what prices. It's extremely hard to track. So data analytics is capturing types rather than tokens. A token is an individual identity. A type is obviously a group type based on proxies. We're interested in proxies. We're not interested in specific characteristics that identify me, Lynette Taylor, red hair, blue eyes, drives or whatever I drive. We're interested in people like me that can tell that I'm likely to be that and to do those things. One example is people whose GPS records suggest they are Muslim. We had an issue in New York a couple of years ago where, they, where the city released an open data set of all of the cab ride trajectories in the city over a certain period of time. And a privacy group noticed that certain cabs stopped at the times of Muslim prayer. This was interesting because it was around the time people were thinking about, are we worried about the idea of a Muslim registry? Do we want people knowing who is Muslim and who is not? And this turned out to be a way of identifying practicing Muslims, except the proxy was inaccurate because a taxi driver medallion, the right to drive a taxi in New York, costs upwards of $500,000. No individual people are able to buy that, really. So usually a medallion, the right to drive a particular taxi is shared between up to six or seven people. And so what you might have is two Muslims, a Hindu, a bunch of Christians, and a Sikh driving the same taxi in the course of a day. And so it becomes very hard to say this taxi is driven by a Muslim. It's an in inaccurate identifier. But it's anonymous, so there is no way in to accuracy there. Here's another one, people whose environmental traces suggest that they have been subject to ethnic violence. This is one where not inaccuracy, but accuracy may be problematic. Does anyone know where this is? Has anyone seen this project's work? Any ideas? It's a, quite a famous photograph now, but it, there's no particular way to identify it. This is South Sudan. There has been a horrific conflict for more than 10 years in South Sudan, where, uh, also known as Darfur, where people have been getting massacred by the North Sudanese government for being a different ethnicity, basically. There's a lot more to it than that, but the characteristics are that of an ethnic conflict. There's a group in the Harvard Humanitarian Initiative called the Signal Project. And since 2008, they have been working on machine learning to identify when tukuls, which are the little huts that people live in in South Sudan, in rural South Sudan, when tukuls have been burned by other humans as opposed to have naturally deteriorated and left, people have moved on, or they've been burned by natural fire or fallen down for whatever reason. So what they can do is they can look at satellite data, which they have access to, and they can identify which villages have been massacred by North Sudanese militias. This became problematic because they realized that the North Sudanese were hacking into their data set, so this is also a cybersecurity problem, and were using it to find out who hadn't been killed yet and to direct their energies to those villages. Because this is a militia issue, and so the government is not directing them specifically every time, they're, they're sort of freelancing. And so what it enabled the government to do was to centralize information very effectively on who's been killed and who hasn't, and to send out militias, little sort of death pods, to the right villages to kill everybody. And the Harvard guys who were working on human rights, they were trying to create policy change and awareness of the genocide, realized that they were in fact informing the enemy, and they were creating policy change, but for the Sudanese government, not for the American government or for the United Nations. So this is a case of some of the most anonymous data on Earth. It doesn't show any humans. None of the satellite data shows a single human being at any point. It's not of that resolution. That is having direct effects on human lives to the point of people getting massacred the same day that this stuff gets published. Obviously, they're not publishing it in the same way anymore. But still, this is an interesting case that sort of blows apart our idea of anonymous data as safe data. This is really problematic. So bringing this back to the present gathering, how long do I have, Valerie? Am I okay? Oh, perfect, okay. What is my data based on this discussion? Well, my data is stuff which enables you to touch me. It's my name, my political party membership documents maybe, my mobile phone number, my tax ID number, something which enables you to transact with me individually. There's also data about me. Here's where it gets interesting. This is data where you can't necessarily find me to transact with me, but you can still act upon me using those data. This would be data like my phone metadata, my location data, my billing data about who I've called and when, where I was when I made those calls, my location history from my GPS device, whatever that is. 
satellite data of the kind that we just saw from South Sudan. All of these data types enable you to act upon me, enable you to intervene and do something to me and affect my life. But they can be, they can be anonymized, they can be de-identified. De then we get data about people like me. Here's where we get into consumer preferences. What is Linnet likely to drive? What is Linnet likely to want to buy today? Political affiliation, who is Linnet likely to vote for? May or may not be right. The implications of getting it wrong are potentially huge depending where I live. If I live in Kenya, for instance, where there is massive election violence, being able to decide who I may vote for is a very big deal indeed. My risk quotient. Here's where we get into, should you call the cops on Lynette because she's been standing still at that part of the street for the last 15 minutes? Who do we think she is? What kind of data can we call on to understand what kind of person this is standing in public space, minding her own business? What should we do about it? Should we try to change her behavior? Should we try to get her to move on? What should we do? All of these data that are showing here, they're all actionable data, one way or another. Philosophically, you could draw a line that connects all of them. Technically, you couldn't. Technically, they work in very, very different ways. Legally, they work in profoundly different ways. But in terms of being actionable, they're all in the same bucket. So our data we arrive at. What is our data? It's data that reflects our identity building process, as well as, therefore, our freedom and our autonomy. There's a wonderful philosopher of information ethics, Luciano Floridi, who works on this. He was part of the book that I wrote. It also provides ways to predict our behavior and that of others. Solon Barocas and Helen Nissenbaum at Princeton did some great work on how consent becomes meaningless the more people you have in your data set. If you have enough people, it really doesn't matter if I say you can have my data. You can tell almost everything you need to know about me, or in fact everything, by looking at the people who are like me. It also may be anonymous or never even identifiable in the first place, but it's still actionable. And it's actionable in terms of the lives of groups, networks, villages, cities, and even states. There's, there's some work that I did a few years ago that talks about the idea of shadow maps and state data doubles, where you can actually act upon states through information of the kind produced by the Orange d for d challenges. Back in 2013, 2015, they did amazing CDR data challenges, which were super interesting, but which predict GDP baselines in ways that haven't been done for developing countries. This has implications, for instance, for the loan status of developing countries, because GDP baselines are very hazy. And if you can really put a number on it, that may kick a country from one loan category into another overnight. This has serious sovereignty implications. So to finish up, this is, this is our book. Um, it has stuff from lawyers, it has stuff from social scientists, and it has stuff from philosophers. It's an interesting debate because we really, none of us agree with each other. The lawyers think that group privacy doesn't work. As soon as it's a group, it's not privacy. Um, the social scientists think it probably does work because factually we see these incidences like the South Sudan data where you have groups and an issue of privacy more in the sort of Warren and Brandeis sense of the right to be let alone than the classic informational privacy sense of my individual sphere of information. Um, and then you get the philosophers who just say this is an interesting challenge in various ways. I recommend the book, I recommend you read it. You can also find bits of it on my website. The book itself is quite expensive. <laughs> I do recommend it, but if you can't afford it, you can find some of it on my website. Thank you very much.